we are very pleased to have nine of our own members here to present some pictures of birds and mammals and other places, things that they have seen over the last year. And so we are going to start out with Robert Perez, who is going to share some information about his California trip and birds of San Diego from last year. So Robert, see if you can step in and take over here. Okay. All right, so good evening, everyone. In 2021, I added 29 new birds to my life list. Uh, 13 of those I saw within the last week of December on a trip I took out west. A friend and I flew into Vegas on Christmas Day and proceeded to Death Valley National Park. After exploring Death Valley, we traveled south to Joshua Tree, then finished our trip in San Diego. While in San Diego, we visited the famous zoo, the USS Midway, a decommissioned aircraft carrier, and took a whale watching trip in the Pacific Ocean. The following presentation will highlight some of the birds I saw on this trip, some new species for me and some old. Ultimately, the species that made it into this presentation are here because the pictures turned out the best. Um, I didn't add any new birds to my life list in any of the national parks I visited this time around. In fact, the birds were very scarce in both Death Valley and Joshua Tree. Um, conditions weren't ideal in either location. So the first new bird I saw on my trip was actually on the Vegas Strip. It was the cinnamon teal, which I saw swimming around in a pool. All right. so. Um, like I said, um, all the pictures I uh, selected for this presentation, I selected based on quality and all of them are from San Diego. Um, so if any of you have been to San Diego, you'll know that the mudflats along the San Diego River are an excellent spot to see birds. This was the first stop I made when I arrived at San Diego and right away I saw a number of new species. Um, although the greater yellow legs isn't a new, new species for me, there were a number um, of them hanging around. Um, the widgeon also isn't a new species for me, but I was able to get some really nice views of it and some nice pictures. There were quite a bit of these guys uh, in the river, greatly outnumbering all the other species of duck I saw. Um, another species that wasn't new for me was the willet. I was able to watch this one as it tried to eat whatever it was trying to eat. Um, this guy was trying to hide, but uh, I spotted him. Although this also isn't a new species for me, it's not every day that we get to see little blue herons. Um, I've seen pipits before as well, um, most notably at Montrose in Chicago, but um, this time I was pleasantly surprised to see it since it's been a while since I've seen a pipit. So this was my first new species uh, that I saw. Um, this is the reddish egret. Although I was unable to observe its unique hunting behavior, it was interesting to see it run around the water trying to catch fish while the other egrets around it were way more patient. Um, this was my favorite bird that I saw on my trip. Um, and as its name implies, its bill was quite impressive. So here's another view of the long-billed curlew next to a widgeon for a nice size comparison there. Um, another new species for me were these marbled godwits. Um, so over the uh, last fall, I saw a couple of the Hudsonian godwits that were around. So with this addition to my list, I think I have the godwits pretty well covered now. Um, another new bird for me was this Cassin's kingbird. Um, and I saw this guy flying around as I was getting out of my car in the parking lot. Um, so it allowed itself um, some really good views. 
I almost missed this wimbrel as it was well camouflaged in the tall grass. Um, and lucky for me, it started moving. So I was able to add this one to my life list as well. Um, I've seen black Phoebes before and um, they were actually in almost every location I went to. So this photo was taken at the San Diego Zoo where it was hanging out with some zebras and it poured almost the entire time I was at the zoo. The first new bird I saw at the zoo was this Allen's hummingbird. They were quite numerous there feeding at the wide variety of flowering plants they have around the zoo. I was able to see a couple of the males doing their breeding displays, which was really cool. Um, according to Cornell, these hummingbirds have two breeding displays, and I saw the one where they fly back and forth like a pendulum, and then fly 100 feet up in the air and come down with a trill sound. So I, this one was taken outside the front gates to the zoo, and then I saw another group over by the koalas. Um, this is a Hearman's gull, um, which was another new species for me. This photo was taken uh, from the boat that we were going to do whale watching in. Um, we didn't see any whales, we didn't see any dolphins, but I saw a black vented shearwater, which was another new bird for me. Um, the last stop on our trip was the Cabrillo National Monument, which overlooks San Diego Bay and the Pacific Ocean. And although the Says Phoebe isn't a new species for me, I was really glad to see it as I've only seen it once before. Um, this one blended in really well with some of the uh, eroded cliffs along the Pacific Ocean. Um, and lastly, um, I saw two of these black oyster catchers on the cliffs overlooking the ocean. Um, these are also not a new species for me, but I've only seen them once before. So overall, I would say this is a very successful trip for me. Um, I'm already putting together my trips for this year. Um, my grandmother and I are hoping to go to Greece in May, Yosemite with some friends in June, and then um, I'd like to get down to Great Smoky Mountains as well. Um, and in December, I'm hoping to get up to Tucson along the border so I can add some more species to my list. Um, in addition to the ones I've already mentioned, the other new birds I added on this trip were the uh, Brant's Cormorant, California Towhee, California Gull, and California Scrub Jay. So thank you very much for letting me share and I can take any questions if anybody has any. Yeah, I didn't mention that, uh, but if anybody does have a question, they can use the chat function at the bottom. And so if you click the chat and uh, type in your question, uh, I can pick out a couple and shoot them over to Robert. And while people are thinking about a question, Robert, when you say the San Diego River, uh, we went there, is that alongside Ross's field? Yeah, that... that's where I was, yep. Okay, yeah, but it borders the, the river and uh, yeah, it's a huge mudflat area and, and lots of wildlife in there. Uh, let's see, uh, Mike wants to know, what were you shooting with? What camera? Um, I... Don't know, <laughs> my, my old camera, I'll have to get it out and check the, the model. I okay. don't remember <laughs> whatever it is, sorry. And do you remember the uh, company that took you out on the whale watch? Um, yes. Did you see any whale? Um, um, it was, let me just pull it up here. Um, it was, San Diego Whale Watch. Okay, good enough. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, good luck this year, but appreciate the, uh, the great pictures that you had from San Diego this year. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone. With that, we're going to move on now to John Baker. And uh, John was in Jamaica and South America, South Africa, excuse me. And so, John, if you can share your screen and uh, take over. Okay, I, I think I'm sharing the screen. If I'm not, let me know. 
Yes, you are. Okay, mostly these pictures are new, but I threw in a couple of old ones that I hadn't shown before. So Jamaica, yeah, I was supposed to go to Scotland to see grouse and uh, raptors and waterfowl, but then Omicron hit and they required a quarantine to go there. So I went to Jamaica instead. The problem with taking pictures of birds is they won't sit still. Well, here's one that does sit still. This is the Northern Potu on its day roost and it just sits there. These birds are relatives of uh, night jars, night hawks, and so they fly at night and eat insects. This bird sat for a second and I was able to snap it. One of the, I think there are four parrots in Jamaica and this is one of them. There's three endemic uh, hummingbirds in Jamaica. This is the one that sat still for me. I'm sorry I didn't get a picture of the front of this uh, Jamaican owl on this day roost, but that would have been down a cliff. So we have to uh, be happy with what we've got. This, this bird was uh, really upset that we disturbed it on its day roost and it was hooting. And in retrospect, I guess I should have tried to take a video and got some of the sound. It has the most low pitched call of a, for a bird that size. Years ago, I went to Madagascar and I don't believe I ever showed this picture, but everybody loves lemurs. And so here's a lemur. And I also went to Uganda and I'm showing this because I want you to compare it to a bird we're gonna see a little later. There are two ground hornbills in the world. And this is the Northern one or the Abyssinian one. This was taken at Murchison Falls National Park on the wrong side of the Nile. <clears throat> Our State Department said that you should not go to this side of the Nile. But since it was crawling with uh, Ugandan army people with big machine guns, I felt relatively safe. Anyway, the birding over there was fabulous. Ah, in October, I went to South Africa and the little pocket country of Lesotho, which is completely contained within South Africa. I uh, started off in Northern Kruger National Park. And this is, uh, as you can see, a close relative of our uh, bald eagle. And of course they have beaters there. This is the heaviest bird that can fly, the Cory Bustard. Uh, I've seen it fly, it doesn't fly very well. It weighs about 50 pounds. And it, that it can get off the ground is amazing. Usually it walks, but if you startle it, it will try to fly. This is one of the many uh, colorful storks that uh, is in South Africa. And it's just barely in South Africa because the other side of the river there, this is Limpopo River, is uh, Zimbabwe. This was taken at uh, Crook's Corners, it's so called because that's where a lot of smuggling took place. Just to the right is Mozambique. And so you got these three countries and an unprotected border. I mean, this river is easy to cross. A lot of guns and people came across here. I'm always amazed at how pretty birds that are just black and white can be. And this is one, but most kingfishers are even more colorful than black and white. These core hands, they're the smaller, some of the smaller bustards are called core hands. Um, there's a red crested, as you can see the red crest the leader of this tour that I was on has been birding in South Africa for over 25 years. He's seen hundreds of red-crested corhans. He's never seen the red crest before. So 
here it is. He was astounded and snapping pictures like crazy. Okay, here's the other ground hornbill. What's different? What's different is the color of the wattle around the eye. The northern one is blue and this one's red. Everybody likes to take pictures of this bird. It's uh, rather colorful. Oh, I perhaps should mention that they're called rollers because of their um, mating display. They actually do rolls in the sky. Another owl on its day roost. This one was quiet, however. Southern bald, there are two bald ibises. The northern one is in Morocco and uh, Egypt and Turkey. And the ones in Turkey uh, migrate between Egypt and Turkey, between the Euphrates and the Nile, but there may be 300 left of the northerns, which look even uglier than these birds. Another Korhan, blue-headed, the females in front, the males behind. Crested guinea fowl, there's six kinds of guinea fowl. This is one of them. The bands on the breast are a little faint, but you can see them. We looked half a day for this bird. We finally found one sitting on a telephone pole looking for snakes. This is in Lesotho. Uh, it's a ground woodpecker. It's a lot like our flickers, except that it's not particularly related, closely related to them. It's related to other woodpeckers more closely. And I don't know what it's doing in Lesotho because at least in this part, there are no trees. So it's got to eat on the ground. We were supposed to see these birds on the way up to Lesotho, but uh, the flowers that they eat were not in bloom. So no sugar birds, but uh, our guide knew a person who had some feeders and there were about 20 of them at the feeders. I had planned to go to Botswana, but the border crossing was too difficult. So I just went to South Africa and I, uh, the wild dogs are much more, e much easier to see in uh, Botswana. And the chances of seeing them in Kruger were very small, yet we saw three packs. This is part of one of the packs. So I was thrilled, it's one of the, animals I really wanted to see and thought I never would. And here are the two other animals that I wanted to see, the aardvulf and the aardvark. The aardvulf is the smallest hyena and it eats nothing but termites. The aardvark is a very primitive animal that uh, it's right close to marsupials in the taxonomic list. And it also eats nothing but termites. And it has very powerful front claws that it rips the termites' nests apart with, and a long tongue, sort of like uh, anteaters. And that's about all I've got. Great, John. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we had lots of compliments in our chats about some of your pictures and uh, the um, one question that came in is do the ground hornbills fly? Yes, they can. Yes. Yes, they can fly. Uh, they, uh, they roost in trees. They just eat on the ground. I see. Okay. Well, you were very informative, had lots of good information uh, beyond just birds. So we, um, we appreciate that. Uh, 
another question about uh, camera. What kind of camera and lens did you use? It's a Tamron uh, 150 to 600 millimeter zoom and it's a Sony A07 or something camera. And except for some of these were taken through a telescope with my iPhone. Oh, really? That worked pretty well then. Yes, if you don't shake it too much. I'm violating the protocol, but uh, John, what's your life world list up to now? 6,357. Wow. <laughs> and where did you... Uh, uh, where did you bird in Jamaica? Was there a certain area or? Uh, yes, it's all at the, um, well, we stayed every night at Greencastle's Estates and birded the grounds for uh, three days and then took um, a trip to the Blue Mountains one day and a trip to the uh, John Crow Mountains the other day. Wonderful. All right, well, thank you so much, John. Where are you off to this year? I'm going to Greece in May. Oh, well, maybe we can meet up with Robert there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Indonesia in July, it, maybe. Uh, depends on everything. Depends on COVID. Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck to you, and thank you for your presentation tonight. You're welcome. All right, now we're going to move on uh, to another part of the world where Suriman Ruth and Prakul. Uh, her backyard birds are several thousands of miles away in Bangkok. So, Suriman, welcome. And uh, take it away Hello. when you're ready. Yes, hi. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can, Suriman. We can hear you. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you, Mike, uh, and hi everyone. My name is Saramon. So um, I just wanted to, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here and wanted to share a few birds that uh, can be found around Bangkok um, in my backyard and the, um, the vicinity of Bangkok. So just to orient you, I think uh, several of you have been in Thailand, but Thailand is like, you know, a little bit above equator. Bangkok is right kind of here. So we do get um, migrants as well uh, and quite a few of, um, you know, residential birds. Um, Bangkok is a very busy city, like over 10 million people, but, um, you know, the birds do find um, places to, to stay. And uh, here is a Gulf of Thailand, so we do get some shore birds as well. Um, so these are, the next few slides would be birds that uh, we saw in, in our backyard. So, so many of these uh, pictures were taken when I went back again, you know, speaking of COVID during that in December when they lifted the uh, quarantine for a couple of weeks. Um, so this is our uh, backyard um, and we try to make it work friendly with lots of trees. And also we have lotus which attract uh, bees and which attract certain birds afterwards. Um, this is a coppersmith bed. He or she lives uh, basically in our backyard somewhere. Uh, we hear them every day. Uh, one of the smallest market, I think, uh, there is. So they have this typical uh, bill and the whisk. Very colorful. Uh, she also makes a hole, uh, a home, really, in one of the um, dead trees in our yard. Uh, and this is the, the baby. Uh, the, you know, the color is trying to, it's not yet fully. Um, develop, but also typical bill and also whiskers um, that he's, I think, I think he or she was almost ready to leave the nest. We also have Oriole. Um, this is a black nib Oriole um, that, um, you know, come to visit often. Um, Eastern spotted dove here. And we have um, street ear bubble, and this picture was taken a few years back already. So, uh, but I think Bubu is one of the, this particular kind. Um, they said that they like to live close to people. So um, she makes nests on our giant um, lime tree. This is the lime leaf. And you can see the nest here. And when you peek into the nest, you see these little babies with the, you know, the sheet, uh, like um, feather, this structure uh, with the sheet still, and eventually a little, 
uh, degrade and fall off and you'll see the full feather. Uh, but eventually, you know, they, they grew up and they, they left. Um, Oriental magpie robin uh, has a very beautiful songs, uh, very um, nice, and they like to sing a lot, uh, very nice in the morning and in the evening. Uh, we also get bee eater, kind of similar, I think it's the same kind of, um, you know, latitude with um, Africa, uh, African countries that uh, were presented um, previously. Uh, but different kind of bee eater. Uh, this is a blue tail bee eater, and I think he came after our bees um, who were after our lotus. Um, this is a very small bird um, called a, a scarlet um, back um, flower picker. Um, sorry, I'm missing uh, his or her beak, um, but it's really tiny, very fast. Good picker. We, um, thank you. We don't have uh, hummingbirds uh, in, in Asia, um, but this is as close as it gets to hummingbirds. It's called um, a sunbird. There, there are actually many kinds of sunbird, but this is the one that we find often in our in Bangkok in the backyard. And she likes, this is a female one, and she likes this uh, particular um, flower um, that she came to eat the nectar. Another kind of bubu, sunda yellow vintage bubu, uh, we see them more in the um, winter time. So those are what um, you know. I took from from our backyard, and um, there are a few parks around Bangkok. We I wish there were more green areas, uh, but the parks that we have tend to attract birds. And this is a migratory one, um, a yellow rumped uh, flycatcher. Um, and I think this was um, not this winter, but in the winter, um, a couple of winters ago, when I visited home in the park. We also get like a family of uh, spotted owl and they, they have babies um, in the park in the middle of Bangkok um, and he was peeking up. Um, Eastern white crested laughing thrush. Um, th this type you see more in, in, the, uh, in the forest. Um, and honestly, I think this guy probably sadly, I think was captured and maybe escaped. Um, and he just found a home in, in, in this park in the middle of Bangkok. Scaly breasted munia. Um, this also, I think you see this in California. And if you look, if you read about it, I believe um, they were brought over um, by immigrants uh, from Asia. So very uh, similar birds that we have here uh, in the United States. Uh, we do also get parakeet, different kind of parakeets. Um, this is um, Alexandrian parakeet. They're not everywhere. Um, they're uh, somehow at this temple, right? Um, maybe a few miles from my house, um, has this flock of parakeets, maybe 100, uh, a little bit over 100. And they do come home in the evening. Uh, and uh, they always have something to say. And the temple was very nice because they have a little um, wooden house for them and they, uh, you know, they live in there. Um, Asian brow uh, flycatcher, um, something commonly can be seen as well around Bangkok. Um, and a, a different type of stork. Um, you saw a stork from Africa um, previously, but this is the painted stork um, they were flying. And we also have Asian open bill. And you can see there are two turtles, two turtles, two turtles there, um, kind of keeping him uh, company. They they actually, um, you know, were once very rare, uh, and then they are now protected. But they do eat a uh, a kind of uh, snail that um, was invasive uh, to the um, rice field. You know, so the farmers would let them come in and eat all those snails and, um, and everyone's happy. Um, we do get waterfowl. This is why it brought Creek um, in, in the same park that uh, we found at Laughing Fresh. And then the next few slides will be kind of birds in the wild, but really not in the wild, but like I kind of try to limit it within one hour drive of Bangkok, just in case if you, you know, you, you visit, um, there is actually within an hour drive, you can see um, several things around. Um, there is a research center that they have rice paddy because they do research on different type of rice. 
and you can um, find this black row uh, reed wobbler there in the rice paddy field. Um, this Indian night jar uh, was actually in my friend's backyard, but her home uh, was about an hour uh, from Bangkok. They like to be on like a, not, not on the tree, like a, a potu, but on the ground. Uh, they have uh, lay eggs on the ground, very camouflaged during the daytime. You can't see them very well, uh, but, but they like to live there. And it's becoming um, difficult, I think, for them to, to find place to, to live just because the, this type of area are, you know, converted to homes, et cetera. Um, this is a migratory um, bird, uh, red spotted blue throat um, that we, we get. This is uh, another Craig. Also, we found her at the same um, Price Research Center, Ruddy Breasted Craig. Um, she was having fun um, taking a bath. Um, and in the same area, we also found another Craig here. Um, we, we do have different types of kingfisher. This is collar kingfisher um, and, uh, you know, other types I didn't have here. This is a black neck lapwing. Uh, they have very distinct sound, like song. You can hear them like flying and you, they usually live in flocks. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we do have shorebirds. Um, this is uh, one of the salt pond um, that we went to visit. And you know they're filled with different kind of shorebirds, but when you look, uh, this picture is kind of an understatement because there are these like hundreds and hundreds of these little birds. Uh, but among uh, these little birds, um, if you notice carefully, um, I, I couldn't. I need help. Um, you would find a spoonbill sandpiper. Um, it's a very um, rare, uh, endangered species. Uh, the little ones they come to uh, visit from Russia. Um, and, uh, you know, they have this spoonbill. Uh, we, I think I, we, so, there are a couple this year, um, and sometimes they're banded uh, because they're in danger. Um, and I was fortunate to get one of those um, flying picture of him in the air. <laughs> and this is a little cheat, cheating because this is more than one hour outside Bangkok, but I, it's beautiful. I can't help but showing it. So it's female breathing hornbill in one of our national parks. And um, in that national park, we also, um, this, this um, group of elephants were by the road and uh, there were actually six of them and I couldn't take a picture of all of them because we're used to taking picture of birds and these elephants are like beyond the frame of the, the camera. I had to like back up, but still we could not get all of six of them in, in the same frame, but they came out in the evening. And um, this is my family. So we all uh, like birding as a family mm -hmm. um, activity. Uh, this is my dad who's now 78. And uh, he started birding after me. So he started, he's in 70. And my mom um, who is 76 and my sister, me. And then um, there's, a little, there's a guy who helped us to help my parents get around. So thank you very much. Bravo, Sirman. Thank you. Mike, I think you're muted. Now can you hear me? Yep. All right. And uh, what I said, uh, Sirman, was we have a lot of comments complimenting you on your pictures. And uh, so you did a great job uh, taking those shots uh, nice and clear. I really like some of the baby chicks pictures, but uh, we also Thank had you. someone asking again, what your camera and lens are that you, you use? Um, yeah, majority of these um, are from my current camera, which is Nikon D500 and the lens is Nikkor 500. Yeah, Nikkor 500, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank right, you. good job, Sherman. John, we're getting to you faster, but John Sabula sitting comfortably down in Florida as the snow comes down here in Illinois. John, are you there? I'm ready. Go for it. Uh, 
Uh, well, come on, where's the, uh, you know what? You were uh, sharing. Yeah. You know what? I, there it is, slideshow. Okay, there we go. All right. Well, I'm, Saruman, I'm glad you shared your backyard birds. I was a little, little embarrassed when I saw all the exotic locations people were showing birds from, and I, I'm just showing backyard birds. You know, it's, uh, you know, the, the first thing I'm going to show you is what I see. You know, I miss my house sparrows. I miss my juncos. So every morning when I get up, um, there's usually a flock of about seven or eight white ibises out front of our lanai. And, uh, you know, see, I see them everywhere here in Florida. You, you, you go to a park in the middle of downtown Naples and there they are. You, you go to the beach and well, right now, because of the tourists, uh, there aren't that many birds on the beach, but during the summer, they're on the beaches. You, you, you drive along the highway, they're driving along the highway. You know, I, I think of them as kind of a cross between a, a house sparrow and a Canada goose because they're everywhere. You try to drive somewhere and they're crossing the road, you can't, can't drive, you gotta wait till they all cross the road. Uh, very nice bird. These are adults. I see a lot of juveniles, uh, they're amateurs, I should say, uh, mixed in with them from time to time. One of these days, I'm going to count how many images I've taken of the white ibis. I think I must have over 100, 200 by this point. Uh, like I said, they're everywhere. But uh, another weird bird I see usually in the afternoon are the anhingas or snake birds. And this one, Again, it's right outside my lanai, it's maybe about 15 feet. And I go out fishing and it kind of looks at me and it gives me the evil eye. They're related to cormorants, a lot of you know that. And so like cormorants, they don't have an oil gland. Um, in fact, in order to dive, they have to let their feathers get wet so they can dive underwater. And at first I thought they might be hard to tell apart, but the anhingas usually swim with just their neck protruding from the water, neck and head. And they jerk, it's a very jerky motion. The cormorants are usually at, more at the surface, although once in a while one will emerge its body. And they can stay underwater for fair lengths of time. And they come up and they sit on the rocks outside my uh, lanai and, and just sun themselves and dry off. And like I said, they kind of give me the evil eye. Another bird that I see every day outside my lanai uh, are snowy egrets. It's not the breeding season, so the little lorry, the little face mask is yellow on them instead of kind of the pinkish red it gets. But, uh, you know, most of you are familiar with the story of these birds, how they were almost hunted to extinction because of their plumage, um, which was worth kind of literally its weight in gold once upon a time. Hunters would come during the breeding season, kill the adult birds, which meant that the uh, nestlings would starve to death. But there again, they're very, very common. Uh, perhaps the most common small heron. I see them in freshwater. I see them uh, along uh, drainage canals. I see them in the uh, long gulf in the salt water. I see them in the mangroves. Um, but this one, like, you know, is now one of my backyard birds. There's a lot of small white herons, and this white heron is a little blue heron. It's uh, immature. Again, it was on the rocks right outside my lanai, and it caught a brown, a Cuban brown and an old lizard um, and ate it. It was associating with a cattle egret, which was also hunting the egret. Uh, I'm sorry, not the egret, it was hunting the uh, lizards. And they'll jump, uh, we have a hedge in front of our uh, lanai and the herons, the egret and the uh, little blue heron here will jump on the hedge and hunt for lizards among the branches. The other bird that hunts lizards frequently is the great egret. And they're not too uncommon, although I find them more inland than towards the coast. I see them maybe once or twice a week at my um, lake, at the lake we live on. But uh, I, see, I see snowy egrets and little blue herons and uh, some other birds much more frequently. 
And this is what the adult little blue heron looks like. Um, they're a very slow, methodical hunter. The very first few times I saw a small dark heron, I wasn't prepared to tell my tricolored for my little blue, but they were actually, once you know what to look for, even in silhouette, they're easy to tell apart. For example, the little blue is a very slow, methodical hunter. It stalks the shore with its head outstretched. Um, besides the uh, anole lizards, I've seen them eating uh, crayfish and that sort of thing. Uh, like I said, they're the most common small, well, least common small heron. And this is the tricolored heron, which is a much more slender bird and a more frantic hunter. When they walk by stalking their prey, their uh, neck and head are held back, you know, in a kind of a prepared to stalk motion. And they, uh, they don't stop. I mean, they're, they're continuously moving along the rocky shores. Every once in a while, I'll see them on the Gulf, but mostly I see them in freshwater and in the mangroves and that sort of habitat. You know, this guy is a gangster. These guys are thugs. And uh, every about once a week, maybe once every other week, a bald eagle will go flying over our lake. Uh, the best experience I had, and I wish I had a video of it, I was enjoying an afternoon adult beverage on the lanai and a model duck, which looks like uh, a female mallard essentially, came flying out of nowhere and dove underwater. Well, they're puddle ducks. So I thought, well, that's odd. And a moment or two later, a bald eagle dove in, tried to get, get it, but the duck managed to get away. But I, I see bald eagles a lot. Now I have to confess, they only fly over my lake, kind of like this, uh, Sandhill Cranes back in Glen Ellen. But there are people who have bald eagles in their backyards. And I photographed this one in one of the neighborhoods here in Naples called Park Shores, which is a residential neighborhood. It's, you know, take away the uh, palm trees and put in some pine trees and some Norway maples. And it would look a whole lot like communities in Naperville or Arlington Heights. I appreciate being told I'm being recorded. So yeah, this this is bald eagles are literally backyard birds. What I did see over my lake one day was ospreys, and ospreys are very very common. Um, you can hardly go a block along any of the major roads without seeing one or two perched on the lamp post. This this was one of a pair that had built a nest, and the bald eagle was apparently trying to harass them somehow or get to the nest. And both both the ospreys were taking turns driving the eagle away. So I, I thought that was kind of an interesting behavior. Not too far from my um, where we live, there's a place called Clam Pass. And uh, if you're you know, if you're lucky, and the tourists aren't kind of choking the beach, you'll see a lot of birds. When I, I have lots of photographs like this that I've taken at Clam Pass. Uh, by my count, there is at least four species in here. The most common one are the uh, black skimmers, which are relatives of terns. And if you're new to birding, they're called skimmers. You'll see that their lower beak is longer than the upper portion. And that's because they skim over the surface of the water after fish. The white birds in the foreground are royal terns, which have a kind of a resemblance to the Caspian terns we see up in DuPage County during the warmer months. Uh, they have an orange bill. It's not the bright red bill of the uh, Caspian. And when they're out, not in the breeding season, they have the white forehead. And oh, here and there in the flock, you'll see another turn with a black bill. Those are sandwich turns. Um, on my screen, it disappears under some Zoom information, but there's a ring-billed gall. 
and there's a flock of sanderlings. But, uh, you know, if someone tells me they're going to Clam Pass, I could probably give them a list of 15 birds, 20 birds, and they'll see most of them there, uh, especially during November, let's say, through March. Uh, once the weather changes like it does now, it's a little more variable. Some of you know, have heard me pontificate how I don't like going to any site where I have to pay to get in. Some of the more famous places to see birds here in Collier County and Lee County, you do have to pay to get in, sometimes quite a lot, and you really don't see that many birds. Um, a place that I like that doesn't cost anything to get in is Bird Rookery Swamp, and uh, it's on Immokalee Road, which is a major road here in Collier County, but it runs east-west before it runs north-south. I was there a few weeks ago, and I had walked a little more than I should have, and I was sitting down on a bench, and there was a female red-shouldered hawk on a branch in front of me, and I watched her, and she watched me, and then as I was watching her, another red-tailed hawk, I'm sorry, red-shouldered hawk came swooping in at me, and I thought, this isn't good, but Instead, it flew up and made it with the other bird. And it, it took a moment or two. I felt fortunate I was able to swing my camera up and get a photograph. And when they were through, they just sat there for a few minutes. If you come to Naples, you come to Southwest Florida, I really recommend uh, the Bird Rookery Swamp. It's uh, got everything that a National Audubon Society site nearby has. Uh, but you don't have to pay to get in and you don't have a lot of tourists walking around saying, oh, look, a bird. One of the things I saw when I was there uh, were black crowned night herons. I know we have those in DePage County, but they're a little calmer down here. So I was able to get a nice photograph of the adult, one of three at it in a kind of an opening along the trail at the uh, rookery. And then by the parking lot, I saw this juvenile just sitting in a tree. So it's a nice contrast to have the adult on the left and the juvenile immature on the right. But when you go to Bird Rookery Swamp, you got to be prepared. And, you know, I don't know why they allow people on bicycles to do these things and people to bring their dogs in. Every once in a while, you'll see an alligator. This one was lying across the road. Uh, Tra path, trail, whatever you want to call it. So I had to step over it, but uh, it was a good size one. It was maybe nine feet long. It looked at me, I looked at it, and I went on my way. It was one of about six I encountered that day. And, and again, when I say they're on the trail, I mean they're on the trail. Now, this is another site I like going to. Again, it's free. It's the 10,000 Island um, National Wildlife Refuge Marsh Trail. It's south and east of Naples along Tam Miami Trail, US 41, which is good old Lakeshore Drive to Sable Drive back in Chicago. And uh, I try to get down there maybe once a month, once every six weeks when we're down here. It's only about a quarter mile to the tower, an observation tower where you can see lots of things. Now the water was relatively high the day we went, I guess this was about maybe a week ago, two weeks ago. So I wasn't seeing as many shorebirds as I usually see. There's there on the left was a wood stork. And uh, I believe that's a uh, little blue heron. Wood storks are kind of remarkable, you know, in the 1930s, estimates were that there were about 75,000 of them here in Florida. Right now, there's probably fewer than 7,500, but I do have managed to see them maybe once a week or so, including uh, at the uh, canal that runs just outside, just outside my uh, neighborhood. And at, it was nice at 10,000 miles to be able to get close there. The they are in some other places. 
And of course, the uh, common gallinules are common there. Um, the coots are here right now. Uh, they, they spend the winters here in big flocks, but the gallinules are common birds year round. And most freshwater ponds that have vegetation on the shore will have a pair or two. A bird that I was really happy to see was the glossy ibis. They're not particularly uncommon. I, I, if I get up early enough in the morning, say just at around sunrise, I might see a flock of 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, ibises flying overhead. But they are little, they spread themselves out once they get into the interior of the county in the marshes. And this one was fairly close to the watch, so I was able to get a photograph of it, and I was happy. I don't hunt birds anymore. Uh, most of my birding falls in the cracks and crevices of my daily life, but I do try to uh, accumulate photographs. I always set my goal of, uh, goal of photographing 100 birds or more a year. And a bird that I see fairly often during the summer months down here in Naples is the swallowtail kite. It's basically a northern South American bird, but they do breed in Florida. And this one, uh, I had seen some the day before at a, uh, my wife's a musician and she was playing it in uh, a resort community and I saw one fly overhead. So I said, well, I'm going to try looking for those. Well, I didn't expect to be lucky. And then we got out of our car at 10,000 Islands and there were about six of them flying, soaring. And usually when I see them during the summer months, they're darting around. Uh, they're not... Uh, they don't soar, but uh, at this time of the year, they're soaring. They're also here about a month earlier than they usually are. Another thing that happens to me a lot down here in Florida is I'll see a bird I don't recognize. I don't even get a very good look at, but I manage to photograph. And then when I enlarge the photograph, I found out I seen something that I wasn't uh, wasn't expecting to. And this is a wide-eyed vireo. The books will tell you they're fairly common, but quite frankly, most perching birds are relatively uncommon in most of the areas that people bird here in uh, Southwest Florida. So I felt very lucky to see this one and it was singing a rather melodious song. I was, that's what called my attention to it. Um, it was deep in the mangrove. So I was lucky that I got as good a sh shot of it as I did. Another thing that happens is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be looking at birds in the sky and I'll see uh, a dark bird soaring overhead. And I saw one at a park just a little, well, it's essentially downtown Naples called Baker Park. And I thought, oh, it's a black vulture, but, you know, I'll get a photograph of it. And when I got home and I downloaded the photo and I started enlarging it, I realized that I had seen a bird I hadn't even been on the lookout for, and that's the short-tailed hawk, which is a fairly uncommon to rare bird down here in Florida. But uh, within the week, I saw one more, and I haven't seen any since. The final bird I'd like to share with you is this brown thrasher, which um, occurs in my you know, outside my condo. It's in my uh, subdivision, neighborhood, community, whatever you want to call it. And there's several pairs of them in, uh, breeding down here. I shared this with Steve a few days ago. Um, approximately over 60% of the birds, 63% of the birds that I've seen here in Naples, I've seen in DuPage County. So, uh, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it's the same, only different. The perching birds are few and far between, but uh, you can see them. The other birds, you know, there are some exotic birds, but you know, really, I want to stress, you, you don't know how lucky you are in DuPage County. You have so many good birding sites. They're so accessible. They have good trails. They're open to the public. You have diverse habitats and you really don't have that much down here. So, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, very nice. Uh look at all the birds that uh, are pretty common there. Do you live right on a marsh? Is that why you were able to see all those? Uh... We live on a, 
we live on the largest freshwater lake in in Naples. It's called Citrus Lake. It's about 44, 45 acres, and it's a spring-fed lake. So most of the uh, communities down here, they have, you know, they, they literally drain lakes, fill them in, build on the site, and then di uh, dig another uh, lake, quote unquote, where it's convenient. Uh, just south to us, there's a, a big uh, retirement community that's been built within the last two years. And uh, you can get in, you know, if you want to get in, it starts at 1.5 million and goes up to 50.5, I think, for a, a, an apartment or condo in it. Uh, but there were four uh, ponds there that were drained, filled in, and now they uh, they have one or two ponds they've built and they put, you know, it's, it's very different. Mm -hmm. What was the name of that uh, park again? The thousand or ten thousand? It's called. It's ten thousand acres. Uh, ten thousand islands national wildlife refuge. It's the largest, largest continuous ma uh, mangrove hammock in the United States. And what I go to is called the Marsh Trail. It's uh, south and east of Collier Seminole State Park, which is a great place to go to look at plants. Um, and it's free. It's, 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 you park, it's a quarter mile to the tower. If you want to walk a little farther, it's a mile and a quarter to the end of the trail. Um, I've never walked to the end of the trail, uh, tell you the truth, but... Uh, you know, we've seen roseate spoonbills there. We've seen, um, you know, bald eagles. I mean, it's probably one of the better places. It's one of the few places where I can see more than 15 species of birds in a, an hour or so. I, I quite frankly, I've gone to, uh, I've gone to an Audubon place down here and I've seen fewer birds than I can see in a morning sitting in my lanai drinking coffee. So no, no. bitter truth. Bitter Great, truth. good, good hearing from you, John, and and seeing your pictures. A lot of people complimented in the notes and comments about how good your your pictures were. So, thank you, so, thank you, John. Let's uh, try to go back to Henry. Henry, are you able to uh, share your screen? Yeah, I think I got it to work. Go for it. Can you there guys see that? Yes, I can. All right. All right, so hello everybody. Um, my name is Henry Mead. I'm a young birder and today I'm going to be talking about birding the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. Um, and this is based off um, a trip that I took with my dad last month, um, mid-February. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to be able to share this with everybody. So why the Rio Grande Valley? So the birds come from different parts of the country and from different flyways. So you have a nice mix of birds from the east and the western part of the country. And some birds will just um, stay the winter. Some birds are year round. And that makes for like a big biodiversity of species. Um, like I said, different habitats combined with a large number of birds um, makes for a huge biodiversity of species. And the whole area down there is set up for birds and birding. So there's hotels geared towards birders specifically. You can take private tours to like experience the area with a guide who knows all the local species and hot spots. And it's just a very cool place to bird and um, a fun experience. So I'm gonna be kind of setting this presentation up based on the hot spots that we went to um, and kind of the ones that were my favorite to bird. Um, yeah. So the first one is Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge. Um, this is a top hotspot for Texas with over 350 species being recorded on the property. Um, and since the refuge is so big with so many different types of habitats, many birds can be found here in a single day. And we spent a lot of time here, specifically looking for the bird in the middle picture, which is a bat falcon. And last year, December of 2021, this bird, which is normally found in Mexico, 
was spotted in the refuge and it disappeared for a little while and then it came back and many, many birders have been able to come down here and see it. And it is the first US record of this species. So very rare. Um, and then the picture on the left is the view from the Hawk Watch Tower at the refuge. And the, on the right, that is the view from the levee at Santa Ana. So um, my next spot that I'm going to be talking about is Estero Llano Grande State Park. Um, so the whole preserve is set up and geared towards birds and birding. Um, it's very, um, it's nice. Um, there's boardwalks, there's over, overlooks, um, like you can see on the picture on the right. So, and there's bird feeders and it's just overall a good birding experience. And in the valley, there's some birds that in the US, you can only see them in the Rio Grande Valley, such as the least grebe, which is on the left. Um, and a lot of those species you can find at Astero. So it's another good reason to bird this place. My next spot that I'm talking about is the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley Brownsville in the Rosaka habitat. Um, so it's a beautiful area to bird. Um, and it's interesting too, because it's on a college campus, the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Um, so basically how this hotspot is set up, there is a land bridge, which runs through, um, or yeah, there's ponds on both sides of the land bridge with lots of vegetation. And it's, it, the whole area kind of attracts a lot of birds. Um, and this is, yeah, there's a lot of species at this spot where on this trip, we only saw those species um, at the Rizaka habitat, such as the fulvus whistling duck, the green kingfisher and the tropical kingbird. So on the left, you can see the green kingfisher in the middle, the tan birds, the four tan birds in the center are the fulvous whistling ducks. And on the right, that's the tropical kingbird. All right, um, this next spot was definitely my favorite, um, which is South Padre Island. And this South Padre, if you didn't know, it's along the Gulf of Mexico and it overlooks the Laguna Madre on one side on the west and the Gulf of Mexico on the east side. So a lot of shorebirds spend the winter here and we didn't see lots of shorebirds in the Rio Grande Valley. So we added a lot of species to the trip list on the island. Um, there are great photography opportunities. A lot of the birds were really tame and um, friendly, I guess you could say. And I'm gonna talk about that a little more on the next slide. And there are lots of local birders and photographers on South Padre, and they all knew the area very well and pointed us in the direction of cool birds that they knew of. Um, and that was definitely something that I found very helpful. And just the, lo the local birding community was very welcoming to visiting birders. Um, on the left, the picture on the left, that is a white morph reddish egret, um, which was a very fun bird to photograph. It was doing its feeding behavior where it kind of runs around in the water and jumps around and it was very cool to watch. And on the right, that's a black neck stilt um, with its reflection. So here's a little more about the bird photography. Um, on the left, that's a tricolored heron on the railing of the South Padre Island birding in nature center and all the birds there were so used to humans that they did not care that you walked right up to them and thus made for very good photography opportunities. Um, and then the picture on the right, that is kind of the behind the scenes shot of that reddish egret in the black neck still from the previous slide and on this one mud flat, there are a bunch of pools of water in each mud flat or each pool of water, I mean, had a lot of species in them, which was kind of interesting to see all the different species kind of mixing together. Um, so in this picture, it's an iPhone photo, so it's kind of hard to tell, but there's five species 
On the left, that's a willet, and then a black neck stilt, snowy egret, the reddish egret, and then that's a tricolored heron on the right. Um, and then in the middle, this is the same bird that you can see on the left. Um, that's kind of how my shots turned out of that bird. All right, and then my next site that we visited was the San Benito wetlands. Um, this was a very interesting place to bird. Um, it was a roadside stop. Um, we kind of had some time to kill before we headed back to the airport. So we just decided to swing by here and we, we ended up picking up some more birds for the trip list and my life list. Um, yeah, those species were the vermilion flycatcher and the groove-billed ani. And you can see the male vermilion flycatcher here on the left and the groove-billed anis on the right. And they were actually very interesting to watch um, because it was, most of the time when we were there it was very cloudy, but for maybe two minutes, the sun kind of poked out and the groove build on, he's jumped out of the reeds, spread out their wings and started sunbathing. <laughs> um, so that was a in very interesting behavior to watch and they're fun birds. And so that's my presentation. Um, just, just um, a little more information. We spent five days in the valley in kind of South Padre II. Um, and to in total, we saw 154 species and that was all on our own. We did not hire a guide at all. Um, so we did pretty well. And most of the three out of the five days were 12 plus hour birding days. So they were long days and we kind of went to a bunch of different spots. These are just a few of them that I thought I'd share. Um, but overall, um, the valley is such a fun place to bird. There's many unique species that you can only see there in the United States. Um, and I hope that everybody gets a chance to experience the birds and the birding community of the Rio Grande Valley someday. So. Thanks for letting me share my experience. Thank you, Henry. Boy, nice job. And uh, you can unshare your screen there for a second. So, it, And a lot of people really enjoyed your, your presentation. Um, and uh, so you introduced yourself as a young birder. How young are you again, Henry? I'm 13. 13 and an accomplished birder and an accomplished photographer too. You're getting really good at that. Thank you. Um, someone wanted to know uh, where are you at on your life list? Um, I added 43 lifers in the valley. So my life list is up to 480. That's great. And uh, so Texas, Illinois, where else have you birded? Um, over the summer, me and my family took a trip to a lot of the West national parks so um yellowstone all the way up to olympic and back down through utah so um i've birded a lot of the united states great great yeah wonderful and what are your plans for this uh, this year um in about a month i me and my family are going to the smoky mountains for spring break and then in september i'm hoping to go down to southern illinois great well, good yeah. job, Henry. Let's see if there's any other questions we have here. Just a lot of compliments. Um, did you get to a place called Sweetwater Marsh? Um, we did not. Okay. And when do you think is the best time to go visit uh, Rio Grande Valley? Um, we went in the winter, but I've also heard that the springtime, um, Texas and springtime, there's a lot of migrants that stop along the Gulf Coast. So I would recommend going in the winter, but springtime is also good, I've heard. Very good. All right. Thanks again, Henry. We'll see you around. Yeah. And one more thing, yes. I will add the eBird trip report in the chat if anyone wants to see like the exact species we saw and where we went. Good idea, thank you. We'll look for that. All right, moving on, we are going to now go to uh, Carol and the World of Warblers from Beth Gunzel. So that's an intriguing title, Beth, if you can come on. 
from here. here. She is. Um, I'm going to just um, leave my video on now and just introduce myself and then I'll turn it off and share my screen just so I can preserve the audio. I think my audio is a little bit wonky, um, but thanks for having me tonight. My name is Beth Gunzel. I'm a new member to the club. Um, my family and I just recently moved to DuPage County in the last four months. So the pictures of uh, the slideshow that I'm going to show is from actually from our old house, um, but I'm um, a beginner birder. So I want to say thank you for welcoming me to the group and um, I'll show you what I have. Share my screen. Stop my video. Um, so like I said, um, I think I'm a, like a lot of beginner birders that started watching from their backyards at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, that's exactly what happened to me. Um, when the world kind of shut down, I started noticing more of the activity in our backyard. Um, we were living in Berwyn at the time. Um, so tiny yard, no trees, lots of noise. Um, lots of busyness, uh, very, a very urban suburb. Um, and I never really imagined that watching a pair of American robins build their nest on top of the light on my neighbor's garage would lead me to a deeper connection to the natural world. I'm grateful for that. Um, since I started watching just from my dining room table in Berwyn um, and just at that location, I was able to experience at least 26 different species of birds just visiting my tiny little yard, um, flying above it, directly above it or uh, overhead um, as a thoroughfare. But it was one cheeky little yellow <laughs> rumped warbler named that I named Carol that really encouraged me to go beyond my backyard and start regularly visiting our local parks and forest preserves and other natural places um, with the intention of understanding birds more. Um, and then also just using the camera that my husband had given me a couple years earlier that was really collecting dust in our closet. So um, yeah, so this is just a picture of Carol. Um, I noticed her for the first time in January of 2021. She was clinging on for dear life onto the suet feeder. And I knew that there was something different. Um, I didn't know what type of bird it was. I had never even heard of a warbler before. I was used to looking at house finches and goldfinches and um, we had a flock of very aggressive morning doves and house sparrows and cardinals, just your regulars during the winter. Am I able to advance this? Wait a second. Hey, oops, sorry about that. Um, I thought what was interesting about having the warbler in the backyard was, well, I had to go on to a Facebook group to ask what type of bird it was. So that gave me my first opportunity to engage with these social media groups that kind of help new birders out. So it was the Illinois Birding Network and it was um, fun getting that help and starting to kind of understand that there was a larger community here. Um, I immediately put out some dried mealworm for this warbler when I did a little bit of investigation about where they're supposed to be during the winter and what they eat. And once she got um, some mealworm, she became my BFF. Um, so she, I started to see her um, not just at the fringes of our yard or struggling with the suet feeder, um, but starting to come regularly. And once I got the other types of seed out of that platform feeder and just put uh, mealworm out for her, uh, she was uh, really uh, started to thrive. Um, it was really interesting watching her go toe to toe with um, some of the other birds. Like I said, if you can imagine the feeders in, in winter in January and you're seeing the house sparrows, we had a mob of house sparrows. The goldfinches were pretty aggressive. Um, and we had this one junco for whatever reason, all the juncos fed off the ground except this one and she, they, one would always go after Carol. So it was interesting to see her adapting to these other um, birds, uh, these year round birds and um, finding her place. She got a little bit more comfortable and sure of herself and she would start sitting on the wire above the feeders um, with the other birds. 
But what this really did for me is it really just opened up an opportunity. Um, as I got handier with my camera and you know, I could look at my pictures later, I got a closer look at the beautiful details and intricacies of the birds. Um, I started looking into how could I prepare for the spring season. I came across the warbler class at um, the Morton Arboretum. Uh, Dennis <laughs> taught that class, that's where I met him. Um, and it got me interested in going beyond, um, you know, this little bird was so interesting to me. I was really interested in learning more about warblers. So I took that course in May and then for the rest of the spring really kept an eye out for them. So I just wanted to share some of my pictures that were just taken um, in mid-May of 2021. Um, these next pictures are all from the Montrose Point Bird Sanctuary and just some of the new um, experiences I had with this with this species. Um, so here's a common yellow throat. And uh, morning warbler. And I, um, it's not a great picture, but I was excited to, to find this one. And here's a female American red start. Oops, they won't go too fast. Black pole male. Class really helped with the ID, um, but the camera helped too because what I learned is that they're just these birds are very difficult to to kind of track down. They just don't perch and wait for their pictures to be taken. So a lot of these pictures were just lucky, where I would just see some movement and I would point and shoot, and later <laughs> look through my my photos and see what I could come up with. Here's a little Wilson warbler with his little toupee, so cute. So one of the things that I think the experience of, of having this little yellow rump in our backyard um, got me thinking a lot more about, um, you know, migration, um, seasons, bird habitats. And I think through all of this came a growing sense of responsibility, just for me personally, and uh, a growing sense of responsibility for the birds and just not only the birds, but the habitats they rely on. Um, I just really felt inspired um, <laughs> by this little bird and started digging more into, um, you know, the issues around native plant gardens, um, planting more trees, uh, eliminating lawn pesticides, because I felt like, you know, if I could get a little yellow rump to stay to overwinter, maybe in the fall, um, I could attract some more migrating warblers. So um, come September, my native garden started to pay off. Um, I saw a number of warblers, but I didn't get a, a lot of good pictures or the black, found a black pole, um, which surprised me. Um, a Northern water thrush, which I just couldn't even believe that there was one of those in my backyard, especially in Berwyn. Um, and this little palm warbler, really enjoyed our aster. And then um, to kind of close out the fall in our yard, this, Nash, this Nashville warbler um, really enjoyed the aster and it was because of the insect. And this thing, I just had a, such uh, a good time watching this little one zip and zoom trying to catch these insects. So it was really um, a good experience. So I know that these are common birds, um, but it just really opened up a good experience for me and encouraged me to do some more work in my community. Um, I started working with a couple other um, residents in Berwyn to talk about um, planting more trees. Um, I submitted an article to a local newspaper about red tail hawks and um, the danger of using um, poison, you know, rodenticides. Um, because, you know, to do rat abatement because of its impact on the food chain and particularly birds of prey. So, um, you know, and I, I'm not saying that a cardinal or a robin um, couldn't move me to the same type of activity, but I think that uh, this little warbler was really my muse and opening up some other doors. Um, so I just thought I wanted to share it. I, I find it's a good example of the doors that can open for people who are interested in birding. Um, and there's just so many other um, you know, opportunities that come along with, with it, uh, in addition to just watching the birds. So thanks for letting me share.
Thank you, Beth. I really appreciate uh, your story and illustrated story and, and what a great variety of backyard birds you've had already. The, um, a lot of people have uh, complimented you on your, your story. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, but uh, your yellow rump warbler is what we would call a spark bird, that spark that got, got you interested in birding. So I would encourage our other uh, members on the Zoom here to make a note in the chat about what their spark bird is. Let's see what some of the others are. But Beth, thank you. You did a great job of presenting and you have some great pictures to go along with it. Thanks for having me tonight. All right, now for everybody, we are in the, uh, the bottom of the seventh, uh, seventh, eighth and ninth uh, innings to go. Dennis, you are up talking about Costa Rica. Hey there, thanks, Mike. And uh, Beth, good to see you. It's been a, a while since that class. And yes. uh, I certainly hope to, to see you in a class in the future. I know Melissa and I bumped into you over at Hidden Lake uh, one day this, this past summer. And I know you, you had your son in tow. I think it's great that you're, you're encouraging him to get involved in, uh, or at least uh, give, giving him some exposure to, uh, to our natural world. That's, that's yeah. a wonderful thing. So keep, keep that up, please. Yeah, I, I will have to say that the class too was another, I don't know if there's a spark class, if that's a term, <laughs> for me, but uh, your class was also my spark class. And you, Dennis, um, I have to say, I mean, I've sent him a couple texts on weekends and asking to help identify birds and he's just great and he's just such a great help so yeah so I got to see your I got to see your great pictures quite often and I was always very impressed so keep it up so I'm going to share my screen now um, make sure I get the right one and the way this this trip started out um, Melissa just decided that she was very tired of winter. And she said, let's go to Costa Rica for a couple of weeks. That's how long we were down there, it was two weeks. And I had uh, free reign on picking wherever we went, um, just so that maybe I could pick up a few birds. I'd, I'd been birding in Costa Rica several times. And um, the list that I generated of, of birds I could search for were all really, really tough birds. So rather than just go for a bunch of birds, I was really focused on getting some, some of the uh, harder to find birds. And we had you know, mixed results on that, unfortunately, but uh, still had a great time. And it was certainly warmer there than it was um, up here. However, on January 25th, when we returned, uh, it was quite cold. That, I think that was the coldest weather we've had all, all winter. So I have a little map here that, that kind of gives you an idea of the route that we took. Uh, we visited a lot of the off the beaten path type places and certainly places, a lot of places I had not been before. So we, we flew into uh, the San Jose area. So it was the Alajuela airport. That's where the international airport is located. So that's right here. And from there, um, the next morning, we, we, um, we had actually hired someone to drive us around so I didn't have to deal with all of that. And our first stop was uh, La Ensenada Lodge, which is a private preserve and ranch. And so that's lo located right on the Gulf of Nicoya, right here. And the whole reason for going there were that there were some target birds there like um, lesser ground cuckoo and mangrove hummingbird, which I missed out on. Our next stop was up here, way up in the north. And that was um, the place we stayed was called Hacienda Guachapelin, and it's right on the outskirts of Rincon de la Veja uh, National Park. So it's an active volcano there, and um, it's like a mini Yellowstone National Park. The, the place we stayed is actually another uh, ranch type area, and uh, they did have a lot of great trails. And you actually had to travel through their property to get to the national park. So uh, we were right on right on the edge of the park there. And the next place we went to is uh, right here. So not that far away, although it's a roundabout way to get there. Um, and we were at Heliconia Rainforest Lodge, which is by yet another national park. This is Volcan Tenorio and um, also an active volcano. And then our last stop was here in number five, that was Arenal Observatory Lodge. And that's the only place on this whole itinerary that I had been before. 
And um, that's almost buried right in the national park itself. And there was a lot of great birding places in the general vicinity. We didn't do all of our birding right on that property. We did move around a little bit. So here's our first stop. This is La Ensenada Lodge. And again, it's on the Gulf Coast um, of Nicoya, um, the Gulf of Nicoya. It's about 900 acres, uh, mostly ranch, but there are about 300 acres that are natural areas with trails. And so uh, it's, not, it's, it's not the greatest lodge, uh, but certain bird groups do utilize it. Uh, astrology or astronomy groups also uh, come here because of the great night skies. Um, the lodging is very, very basic. This was our cabin right here. So we had a really nice tree out in front here that attracted a lot of birds. And uh, this is what the uh, common area looked like. So dining was all along here. And then this is kind of a, just a little lounge area. That's, that's Melissa there. She's the one who had the great idea to, um, to go to Costa Rica. She would not have picked this spot, but um, there were target birds. So right outside of our cabin, uh, one morning, actually it was one evening when I first found them, but they were there the next morning as well. Uh, we had a pair of Pacific screech owls and this picture was actually taken from our porch uh, in a palm tree. So it was just right, um, right outside of our, our front door basically. So those are Pacific screech owls, which turned out to be a pretty common species. I did see them quite a bit, uh, not only here down at La Ensenada, but then our, ne our next stop as well, we found them uh, roosting there as well. And then right from the uh, dining area at lunchtime one day, um, I had this lineated woodpecker. So this, this photo I actually took without even getting up from my lunch. Um, it was just right there, right off of the edge of our dining area. And some of the other birds uh, that you can see around there quite commonly would be things like ring kingfisher, royal terns, uh, double striped thickney, and white tipped dove. We did go out on a little uh, boat ride for about three hours into the mangroves searching for that mangrove hummingbird. And we tried and tried and tried, but just uh, no, no luck there. But back at the uh, dining area, uh, this is a white-throated magpie jay. And I, I have a little video here that we can watch this guy. He, uh, he came in after we finished our lunch and he gobbled up our dessert, which was pineapple. So we'll just give you a minute to watch that. He's having a great time. I chopped up my pineapple into nice little pieces, uh, but he was more interested in these big ones like this. So, um, lesson learned. You know, you don't have to you don't have to slice and dice your pineapple for magpie jays. So our next stop was uh, Hacienda Guachapelin, and again, it's about a 900 acre ranch slash resort, and it borders the national park. And they do have a lot of activities there, so it's a great place even for families. So if you want to go out and do a little birding and you know the family can do all sorts of other things. They had zip lining there, they had uh, rappelling, they had tubing, uh, whitewater rafting, horseback riding, just all sorts of activities. And as a part of all the facilities there, they also had a shuttle bus that on a regular schedule would take you to the uh, gates of the national park. So you could go there and spend as many hours as you wanted to actually exploring the national park. But the grounds themselves were very nice on this ranch. Uh, this is one of the waterfalls that we walked to one, one morning. We were here for four nights. Uh, and here's the actual entry to the, to the national park. Uh, lots of trails in the national park, lots of trails on the property as well. So you go birding all over the place. Uh, I did hire a guide to uh, help us out when we were here, um, just because I was looking for some pretty tough target birds. And, um, he met us at uh, quarter to six in the morning and birded with us until probably about 4.30 because I told him that he should go home. <laughs> he was great. He was just phenomenal. He got, he got me some really great birds. Uh, while we were at um, the stop, we ended up with some of my main targets. So we had thicket tinamou and tinamous are always tough no matter what species. This was a particularly tough one. I, I had been trying for that for a while. Uh, this bird here is a uh, lesser ground cuckoo, another video. And we had fantastic looks at that. This is actually through a spotting scope. And um, our guide's name was David Vargas. And so he's actually shooting this video of this bird. You'll see David in just a second here. I don't know what he was doing with the camera, but oh, there he is. <laughs> but a fabulous bird. This is a, this is a bird that not too many people get to see very easily. <laughs> So that was a great, great bird. Uh, he also uh, got a yellow-eared toucanet for us. This is a female. 
and that's a real hit or miss, hit or miss bird, uh, unless you you know where they're breeding. Uh, it's, it's a bird that you just kind of have to bump into more or less. Get into the right habitat, you're gonna have some luck. Um, but you know, not not a commonly seen bird. This is the only encounter I had in the whole the whole time we were on the trip. And then some more common birds. Here's a, a turquoise browed mot mot, a white fronted parrot, and this is a, a female uh, blue throated golden tail on a nest right along the trail's edge that was up in the national park. And we had lots of critters uh, throughout the uh, trip. Uh, we've got some howlers. We ended up with three different monkey species. We had howlers and we had spider monkeys and we had white faced capuchins. We had both sloths. This one happens to be a three-toed sloth. Uh, these are tent making bats, which they commonly do this. They'll huddle all together underneath a palm frond and uh, they just kind of, that's where they roost all day long. Uh, and this is a, a northern tamandua, which, which is an arboreal form of uh, an anteater. So a pretty cool bird that, or uh, animal that I haven't seen very often. When we left uh, Guachapalin and we were heading to our next site, uh, we actually did a little uh, rafting trip on, a, on the uh, Rio Tenorio. And along the way, we saw more boat build herons than I've ever seen before. And I certainly have never had the opportunity to photograph one where you could get a perspective on the bill like this, where you can really see why they call it a boat build heron. And this is bare throated tiger heron, which we, we saw those quite often. We had fasciated tiger heron on the trip as well. And uh, here is our next stop. This is Heliconius Rainforest Lodge. I'm not sure how large the property is, but they did have several trails and then uh, included in one of the trails is they have uh, three suspension bridges which you can walk across and here it is here and again off the beaten path so they did not have a lot of guests and while we were there uh, we went on these bridges several times uh, we were there for three days I never saw another person on the bridges so we had them all to ourselves which was great and we also went into the national park I also lined up a guide for one day here and the target bird that I was looking, well, I was looking for several here, but uh, the target bird that we did manage to get was um, black-eared wood quail. And wood quail are, are notoriously difficult to get as well. So um, those were the only lifers I had. There were only four on the trip, but they were all really tough birds. So I was quite happy. There's a few birds that were hanging around uh, at that lodge. Uh, they did have a feeding station. So air carries would come in every now and then. And on one of the trails, we, we bumped into a crested owl, which was nice. Then our last stop was at uh, Arenal Observatory Lodge. And I had been there before. My last trip about oh, eight years ago was one of my organized birding trips. And we did stop here for two or three nights on that trip. We were here for three nights uh, this time around. Um, this is a common area in between registration and the restaurant over here. This was our room. And we were located great in a great spot because uh, the hummingbird gardens were all out here off of our porch. So we had a lot of verbena out there, hummingbirds all over the place. And you can see the volcano right here. So we had great views of the volcano when the clouds were um, not blocking it. Here's the, about the best view we had on the whole trip. So this is a popular destination for birders. A lot of, a lot of birders do come through this area and um, it's, it's a great location. They do have some nice trails. They certainly have a nice uh, feeder situation set up, and uh, we enjoyed that quite a bit. We also went to an, an area to do some birding called the uh, Children's Eternal Rainforest. And so that was um, an interesting site, uh, and they were getting some really good birds there. Uh, it's a place you can go for um, the, the umbrella bird that they have in Costa Rica, which I've never seen. And they had also recently had uh, uh, several records of uh, Rufus Vented Ground Cuckoo which is an extremely bird, hard bird to get, um, but we did not see either of those, unfortunately. But I did get many hook-billed kites, and we saw them in several different plumages. Uh, Montezuma's or pendula were all over the place. Brown jays are, are pretty easily seen as well. So we had some good mix of birds while we were there. Uh, this is back at the lodge, and so this is the restaurant here, just for some orientation. And then they have this large deck that comes off of the uh, restaurant. And out here is a feeding station. You can just kind of see some little dots right here in this picture. Well, those are all pieces of watermelon that are on prongs that are on this big feeder. And they, they lower it down, they, they load it up with all the fruit and then they hoist it up here. And so um, initially you get all sorts of really big birds coming in there. Uh, crested guans are all over it. We even had great curacao flying up into the tree 
and up onto that feeding station and feeding up there. And then all the oral pendulas and ericeres are there as well. So you get all the big birds, they eat up most of everything. And then the little bits that are left, the uh, tanagers come in like good golden hooded tanager, emerald tanager, frequently seen there and green honey creeper was also there quite a bit. So um, that is it. It was a great trip. Uh, like I said, two weeks, we're already making plans to go back next year. Uh, Melissa has this idea that we're going to spend our Januaries down in Costa Rica, apparently. So uh, I'm all for that. And uh, I'm already working on my target list for next year. So, so that's all I have. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. Question, uh, what's your life list at right now? Uh, well, uh, it's certainly not as high as John's. I'm at 4,800 and... 20 or something like that, somewhere in that general ballpark. Actually, I haven't, I haven't added my Costa Rica birds in yet. I have to do that. Okay, when, and uh, you were a spark instructor for many of us. So thank you for all the classes you've done. Uh, That's right. Heard. Hello, yeah, fellow birders. My name is Dennis Candy. <laughs> all, <right. laughs> all of you have heard that at some point, right? Yeah, all right. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, now we're going on to Bonnie, Bonnie Graham, talking about BBB. Come on in, Bonnie. All right, all right. Let me, let me see if I remember how to do this. Go here, share my screen. Let's see. Oops, Cook, I need your help here, Cook. Wait, oh, I got it. Okay, all right. Hang on, it's coming. Okay. All right. We got it. Everybody see it? You're on. Okay. Perfect. All right. So my presentation is Big Ben Birds Part Two. Um, I think about three years ago, I did a Big Ben's Bird Part One. My husband and I decided to go back last, last um, April because the first time we went, we went too early to get the Klima Warbler. So um, I really wanted to get the Klima Warbler before I was basically too old to hike all the way up to see um, the Klima Warbler. And Big Ben is about maybe 1400 miles from my house, according to Google. And when I told people we were going back to Big Ben, you know, their response was, weren't you just there? And I go, yeah, but we didn't get the Klima. And, you know, so they're like, you're driving 1400 miles to see one bird. And, you know, to us sounds perfectly normal. I mean, that's, that's perfectly logical thing to do. But a non-birder kind of walks away shaking their head. But um, I did have three birds, three target birds for this trip. One being the Klima warbler, which is um, the only place you're gonna see it in the United States from what I read is in Big Bend National Park. Um, prior, prior to us going, I read an article on Texas bird and I saw that the golden cheek warbler and the black cap vireo we're in a state park called Lost Maples, which about six hours, six hours, I think, um, let me see, north of northwest or northeast of Big Ben, which we would be passing that area. So we decided to make a stop at Lost Maples first before Big Ben. And so my three target birds were going to be the golden cheek warbler, the black cap vireo, and the Kalima warbler. So we left and we did stop at uh, Lost Maples, which is a nice state park in um, some place in Texas near San Antonio. And the first time we got, I got my golden cheek warbler, uh, was a lifer. Um, we heard many golden cheek warblers, but we only saw one. And this, this guy was way up in the tree. Thank God for a telephoto lens and zoom on uh, Photoshop. And um, the article, also stated about the black cap vireo that you would probably have to walk about an hour or so from the parking lot up the mountain in order to see it. If you were lucky, you might see it before you started the trail, the east trail up the mountain. I'm happy to report that I got lucky and we didn't have to, I saw it basically a half hour from the parking lot, although we did continue up the mountain. Um, again, we heard many of these birds, but we only saw one. So, and I was surprised how small these birds were. They're about the size of a bell vireo, 
Um, I thought they would be a little bit bigger, but um, I saw this, I, I first heard him sing, and at first I thought he was a white, a white Iverio. And as my husband was taking a photo of a flower, I came back, I had a backtrack and I saw him. And um, so right off the bat, I got two of my tiger birds off. So off to um, Texas or uh, Big Bend National Park. We got there the next day and surprisingly, the Northern Mockingbird is Texas State Bird. And if you go to uh, Big Bend National Park, there is no shortage of mockingbirds. Every day there were, we probably saw, I would say close to, for the week we were there, probably over 20 mockingbirds singing all over the place. Um, I like this photo just because of the composition of him sitting on this, to me, an odd looking plant. So in order, um, eBird is a big help to find the Klima warbler. One of the trails that it was spotted was called the, um, the Pine Canyon which is a easy, there's no climbing or anything on, on this trail. It's from the car to the end of the trail to back is about four miles, which, which is not too bad if you take it nice and easy. Um, so we started to hike that trail and, oh wait, no, 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 this is before the trail. Lots of swains and hawks, probably the most swains and hawks I've seen um, on this trip, we saw them in fields hunting. We saw them sitting on light posts. When you go to Big Bend National Park, you're gonna see a lot of cactus wren. Um, cactus wrens are a lot bigger than our, our house wrens. I think cactus wrens are probably close to six inches and you'll probably hear them sing before you're gonna see them. Okay, so now we're walking down Pine Canyon to find the Kalima warbler. Um, along the trail, we came across this yellow rump warbler, which we've seen here in the Midwest. The, the differences between our Midwest warbler, uh, yellow rump and the one down west or south is um, we have the myrtle, which is a white throat, and the Audubon, which is in Texas, are the yellow throated, which is um, the difference. I also came across a canyon towhee, which isn't as colorful as our Eastern towhee, but nonetheless, it, it's, it's got its own beauty. Another lifer that I got here, um, which wasn't on my target list, the Hammond's flycatcher, who posed nicely for me as we were hiking through the woods. And I got a hunting's vireo, which was nice enough to belt out the song for me so I was able to identify it. And then there are a few of these around the dusky flycatcher. And I almost uh, mistook this one for a chipping sparrow and then I had to realize where I was and um, I got another lifer of the brewer sparrow. So we were done with the hike and unfortunately the Kalima warbler was a no-show. So I was kind of bummed out, but there were a lot of other birds, a lot of other trails to hike. And this trail that we went on was a road runner just passing right through. We, we've seen a couple of these road runners and they always have a place to go. They're not, I've, I've never seen one just kind of stop and sit and relax. They're always going from one place to another place. I like to call this the Texas, Car the Te Texas Cardinal because uh, I have a hard time pronouncing what this bird is really called. I think it's the Perhuluxia. Um, they sound almost like our Cardinals, but I think their song is a little bit quicker. A lot of those birds are around in the Big Bend National Park. A lot of white winged doves, you usually hear them before you see them. This was the first time um, one of these doves was just sitting on a perch and didn't even care you walking by, just kind of looking at you. And I went my way, he went, and he just sat there. Really pretty birds. Uh, another big bird to catch is the Vermilion flycatcher. Uh, one of the best places to see these at Big Bend National Park is at a campsite, a campground called um, Cottonwood. There's, 
when we went there, walked around, we just walked around the campground and there must have been about four pairs. And this is the female just trying to find some food. Not as flashy as the male counter, but the males are really beautiful. The bright red and the black, just, just a beautiful bird to see. And one of my favorite sparrows um, down, down in Texas is a black-throated sparrow. This time around, uh, the second time down in Big Bend, I didn't see as many birds as I did the first time. And I don't know if that's because when we went, it was nesting season or, or what, but it took a few days before I saw one of these guys. Last time we saw them every day. This last trip, I think maybe we only saw them one or two days. And this was the huge surprise for me. This was, um, it's a Western screech owl. And he was roosting in a dead tree that must have had about thousands of bumblebees buzzing. I mean, the whole tree was shaking with all the bees. And it's a, it was a tree right in the middle of the path. The path, the, the trail actually went around the tree. And I learned, you know, besides where I was being out west, I would like to know what's the difference between a, our Eastern screech owl and the Western screech owl. And one of the things is their, the Western screech owl's beak is black compared to our Eastern screech owl where our bills are more like a greenish, um, brownish color, disc, discoloration. And the next photo will show you exactly how big this tree was. So he's just sitting in the middle of the opening and this tree was at least this big, probably probably a little bigger because I didn't get all the way around it. So now we had um, Ebert said that the Klima warbler was spotted on a trail called the Laguna Meadow Trail, which was rated as a hard hike, which I wasn't real pleased about. And it was about four miles up one way. So we got, um, I figured, you know what, I'm 60 years old. I'm not gonna be able to do these big hikes for very long, I don't think. So we got an early start. And the first bird we saw was this beautiful Western tanager. Um, we saw lots of other birds on the way, vultures, uh, the spotted towhee was just finding some seeds on the ground or bugs or whatever he was. Seems like the few, the few times I've seen the spotted towhee, they really don't care about hikers walk, going by. They're like, you do your business, I'll do my business and we'll get along. Um, once I reached the top, there must have been about five other birders up there that's been up there for a few hours looking for the Klima warbler. So my hopes were kind of getting low. And I was talking to another birder and, and within two minutes, the Klima flew into the tree. And of course it was the sun was in the wrong section and blah, blah, blah. But um, I got the binals out. I got a good look at him and I got the camera on and this was like the best shot I got of him. But at least it made the hiking back down a lot more enjoyable because I would have to go back to, to Big Ben again to try to find him because I wanted really to get this bird on my, uh, my list. So I would recommend if anybody's never been to Big Bend National Park, it's a beautiful park to go to. Um, it's got great hiking trails and it's just a, it's a nice place to go. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, <laughs> wonderful pictures as, uh, as always from you. So we appreciate that. And now for the audience out there, we are in the bottom of the ninth. We are waiting for the the big hitter, Joe Sujeki, coming up talking about the Yucatan Peninsula. So, Joe, go ahead and, and bring us home. Great. Ready. Okay, well, thanks, Mike. Um, we're running a little bit long, so I'll move through these uh, fairly quickly because I'm sure everyone else has other things they need to do. So um, we did a trip <clears throat> in December of uh, last year, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, 
which of course has the uh, the famous ruins of Chichen Itza. And we started out uh, over in the touristy area of Cozumel and then went to the mainland and then got on across through Chichen Itza and ended up on the uh, kind of the northern coast of, of the peninsula. Um, and Cozumel is the, uh, the island which is great for scuba diving or snorkeling and what have you. But it's not that far from uh, you know, the mainland of Mexico. And yet there are a number of endemic species out there. And uh, this is one that we're searching for, the Cozumel Emerald. There's also a Cozumel Vireo and, and a bunch of other Cozumel stuff. But uh, we were glad we were able to find them out there on the island. Uh, this was a new bird for me, the Western uh, Spindalis, kind of related to Tanager. It's a very, very striking bird. Um, down there, Bonnie showed you the northern mockingbird. This is a tropical mockingbird down there on the island. And then uh, this is the uh, picture of a house wren. And um, interestingly enough, right now it's um, uh, the house wren or southern house wren, but the word is that um, the ornithologists are looking at this possibly be a split. And then there would probably be the Cozumel house wren. So uh, here's a picture of a bird that I can put on my life list later. When it's uh, a, a different species than the rest of Mexico. Then there are some wet areas out there. This is a uh, kind of that was uh, along the road in one of the marshes. And uh, uh, this, this was one of Dennis's trips. And so you might think of Dennis as a, a mere birder up here in, in DuPage County, but he's actually a, a, a restaurateur throughout all of Mexico. And so we had to visit one of his chain of restaurants up there on Cozumel called Casa Dennis. And he was very happy that we could find the uh, location out there. He still had to pay, but you know, he, he felt he's the owner. Pretty thrilled that we were going to Casa Dennis for We had a good time. Uh, from, the, from Cozumel, we then headed uh, to the mainland and then birded south a little bit. And uh, this is a picture of our rose throated tanager. Um, so we made our way across to Chichen Itza. Uh, and we did a tour of the ruins, which is very nice to see. Um, Here's a picture of a couple collared heresaries that entertained us one morning outside of our hotel. Uh, also had lineated woodpecker there. So we're copying some of Dennis's birds that he saw in, in Costa Rica. The other one, uh, turquoise called Matma. So those are uh, other, you know, just some of the inland birds we were able to look at. Um, uh, one time was a an inland lake, which had a very nice marsh area around it, and um, you know uh, there was a question as to whether we would go there or not, and the the option to go there meant that everybody had to get up real early in the morning and leave by five because it was a couple hour drive out there, and uh, of course you know most of us said sure let's do that so we got out there it turned out to be a very great uh, wetland area. This is a picture of a limpkin that was there. Also had a uh, ring kingfisher. Uh, purple gallinule. And then a uh, picture of a uh, ready uh, crate. Bird we're looking for is this next one. And uh, this is a, a spotted rail, and it was something that, in particular, Dennis wanted to see. And we had been walking the whole morning along this marsh, um, and the guide was, you know, occasionally played a tape, and and we're looking for these birds and weren't able to find them. And then we we're kind of almost done, and we went out to this one area that had kind of a wooden boardwalk and platform, 
and our guide heard something rustling down in the reeds. And indeed, he was able to, to find this uh, spotted rail. So we all celebrated after that. Could just got a couple good pictures of it, you know, through all the heavy vegetation, but you can, you can see. So that was one that uh, Dennis uh, down in, in Yucatan, this is a, a lesser road runner. And this isn't a particularly good picture, but the story was great because we've been birding for a long time and we're kind of going to get out of the habitat for, to see lesser road runners and we hadn't seen any. And then we were stopped at this one little town and um, with our guide and she was looking all over and and she, she spotted this one way on this far away rock wall and we we're all, all the rest of us were trying to see it and we couldn't actually see it. And so she got very animated and started jumping up and down and turning us in the right direction to see that bird. So she chased her so that we all got on that bird. Um, after that, we went into the, uh, the coastal area, uh, which was a great place for uh, many of the uh, marsh birds and, and uh, mangrove birds. There's just a picture of a couple of American flamingos. And in fact, our local guide for the trip was an expert on flamingos and who was actually doing a lot of work out there and conservation efforts for the flamingos. And one of the biggest colonies of American flamingos is uh, pretty close right there off the Yucatan Peninsula. We also did a little boat uh, trip. This is the uh, air throated piper heron uh, in the mangroves there. Also got good looks at the American uh, pygmy kingfisher, which is very small. Um, uh, tiny kingfisher compared to and then also in that area, um, we came on a couple more Yucatan endemics. This is the Yucatan wren, which is very similar to the um, kind of to the cactus wren, maybe a little bit smaller. But we were able to find a pair of those there. And also, almost on our last day, uh, we were able to get this Mexican sheertail, another endemic that you can only find along coast there. So it was another uh, great trip. And here's our group. You'll probably recognize some of the uh, usual suspects here, uh, taking that Chichen Itza when we toured the ruins. Um, so that's, uh, that's our Mexican trip. Great job, Joe. And thanks for, uh, for bringing us home, all of you out there for watching. Uh, Please give your thanks to our nine presenters who did a great job of showing us such a wide variety of birds here today.